Hello and welcome to this podcast from the BBC World Service. Please let us know what you think and tell other people about us on social media. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. I am the world's worst when I'm hungry. I'm terrible. I'm the worst too. But belly full. I had food in my mouth about one minute ago, but not anymore. <laughs> so I'm good. What was it? Make me jealous. Waffles and um, bananas. Oh, That's lovely. Very American. Goal! Leading the conversation on the global game. This is World Football on the BBC World Service. Hello from me, John Bennett. Great to have you with us. There's no Manny Jasmi this week, but I'm pleased to say that Pat Nevin and Heather O'Reilly are here as usual. Hello to you both. Hello. How are you doing, John? Yeah, very well, Hi. thanks. Hi, Heather. I actually want to start with you, Heather, actually, because in the men's game, it's all, the, all about the international break this week. But in the women's game, we had the, the Champions League quarterfinals, which kicked off this week. Some really entertaining first legs on Wednesday. I, I watched the Barcelona game against Manchester City. Barcelona were exceptional. Did anything stand out for you? What, what team stood out? Yeah, I'm on the same page as you, John. Barcelona was excellent. Winning 3-0 over Man City was a, was a pretty good thrashing. So they've made strides from last year where they fell to Lyon, uh, ultimately. Chelsea were very good. Pat should be very excited. I mean, you know, there's a chance. There is a chance for both women and men to do something excellent this year. And Bayern Munich was also very good on the women's side. So maybe this is the year that Lyon will be overturned. Yeah, Pat, Chelsea could do the double, the Men's Champions League and the Women's Champions League. It's looking really good, isn't it? Particularly for the, for the men under Tuchel at the moment. I wouldn't say looking really good, but it's possible. <laughs> uh, it's, a bit like Manchester, it's a bit like Manchester City, you know, people talking about winning all four competitions in the men's game. It's possible, but um, and it would be an incredible thing, certainly for the Chelsea women. I, mean, I watched that game against Wolfsburg, who were very unlucky. <laughs> they had the post a couple of times. They had a lot of chances and uh, goal ruled out as well. Um, but Chelsea have found ways of winning. And so the Chelsea women's team, they, they, they've got a lot of good players. They've got a big enough and good enough squad. So it's a tough one for them. Um, but uh, Tuchel at Chelsea, yeah, exciting times. And they're not complaining about the draw against Porto. Yeah, exactly, we'll that's that what I was going to say. I'm, I'm more optimistic than you. I mean, Porto are a really good side. I watched their game against Juventus and they, they deserve to go through. But uh, that's a great draw, isn't it, against Porto? It, it is. Everybody in Champions League football for the men... All you want to do is you want to stay away from Manchester City and stay away from Bayern <laughs> Munich. That's it, you know. And Chelsea have managed, you know, with the draw all the way to the semi final and to the final. If they do the business, they would, do, you know, they stay away from both of those teams. And both of those teams for me are, are still the favourites. And I would say probably Manchester City because I've watched a lot of them this season and they're beginning to look unstoppable. And I heard you commentating at the weekend on the old firm derby. Rangers had already secured the title and there was a, a, a big debate before the game against Celtic, whether Celtic were going to give Rangers a guard of honour, which happens for the champions in the English Premier League. It's happened over the last four or five seasons. But Celtic didn't give Rangers the guard of honour. Should they have done it, Pat? Should they have put rivalry aside for that gesture? I think, I'll I'll be honest, shall we whisper this? This is a media-driven thing. Mm. The players don't care. The clubs don't care. <laughs> I mean, the Celtic will just tell you, well, wait a minute, they won it two years ago and Rangers didn't give them a guard of honour. They can say that quite easily. So it wasn't being small-minded. It's generally not the done thing. But in the background, yes, there is a little bit of they couldn't have brought themselves to do that. <laughs> <laughs> They're old rivals. And I fully understand that. Their fans, who weren't there, obviously, wouldn't have been able to stomach that either. Uh, so mm, not as big a deal, um, but there was a classy action. And I should tell you about this just before the game, which outshone that by a long way. Um, there had been some racist comments, uh, alleged racist comments to one of the Rangers players during the Europa League game during the week. And it was very, very difficult and painful times. And Scott Brown, the Celtic captain, went over and hugged them before the game on the pitch. And for a Celtic player to cross that line and hug a Rangers player, and and it was Scott Brown that did it, who is not the most loved Celtic player by Rangers fans. It was a great moment. And those gestures, that's classy, isn't it? That that matters, doesn't it, Heather? That that symbolic gesture of the Celtic player going over to the Rangers player. Absolutely, as Pat said, you know, humanity wins out in a situation like that. You know, you can put rivalries aside, and uh, that is one issue that I think. 
you know, most all players around the world, uh, men's, women's, wherever you're from, um, are, you know, really unifying for. So, uh, yeah, that was great to see. But uh, like Pat said, some things uh, are tough ones to swallow, and that guard <laughs> of honor might have just been too much for those guys. You must have had one, though, Heather, during your career. Surely the USA team have been given a, a guard of honor or two down the years. It's a little bit um, uncharacteristic to, to do it, you know, traditionally in the U.S. I do remember that for at, at World Cups, um, it's tradition for the, the winning team to do sort of a guard of honor for the second place team. Um, and I remember in 2011 when Japan beat us out in the final, uh, that was one guard of honor I was like just very touched by because it, it was genuine. It wasn't some like look away, clap your hands and not really mean it. It was a it was a genuine show of respect. So that's one that I'll remember for a long time. Can, can I very quickly tell you the last time that it happened to me and uh, I was playing for Chelsea and Liverpool won the league at Stamford Bridge and Kennedy we scored the winning goal. And there was some suggestion that we should applaud them off the pitch. And it is the last thing in the world that we wanted to do. <laughs> there was another team winning the league on your pitch. Uh, we weren't having it at all. We were in the bath before they got off the pitch. <laughs> I can understand that. I can understand that. A lot more from uh, Pat and uh, Heather coming up. But we're going to start with an idea which could have taken a, a big step towards becoming a reality this month. Cross-border leagues. That's because talks are continuing this week after Belgium's leading clubs voted to back a possible merger with the Dutch top flight. The new combined competition is being called the Benner League. Although it's just an agreement in principle at this stage and there are many more obstacles to overcome, it's got some really high-profile support. But on the other hand, some fans' groups fear it will only benefit the bigger clubs. So why this desire for a new combined Dutch-Belgian league? And is it really likely to happen? I've been speaking to Pierre-Francois, the current CEO of the Belgian Pro League and the former Director General of one of Belgium's top clubs, Standard Liège. It's very important to confirm that there is no decision made at this moment. It's a fake news to say we have decided to merge, but the clubs have decided to begin the process with a positive approach. Till now, it was a a project conducted by five clubs in Belgium and six clubs in the Netherlands. And the Pro League in Belgium was, wasn't at the table. No, we'll discuss it directly. And I have received the, the task to represent the Pro League in, in this process. And uh, it could be very interesting to reduce the gap between the first five leagues in Europe and leagues like the Dutch one and the Belgian one. So, as you say, still a long, long way to go. But this is, this is fascinating to me that this process is even being talked about. You mentioned you want to lessen the gap between the Belgian and the Dutch league to the other big leagues in Europe. But what's the other major driving force? Is it, are these financial reasons that you want to join together? Is it a real struggle at the moment for the Belgian clubs financially? The COVID has uh, made a lot of damages in, in the clubs. And without the... In the investments of the owners, the situation could be much worse than now. Uh, but the, the, the process was already conducted by 11 clubs before the COVID. And I think that the first purpose is a sportive one. I want to, to believe it. But of course, if you reduce the sportive gap, you ensure a, a better position, economic position for those clubs than now in the domestic championship. But it will not be enough because we have to obtain also a long-term vision, a positive long-term vision for the other clubs. We have to promote, we have to avoid the relegation. That's the way to consider the football in Europe, uh, the, the Bene League may not become a, a closed competition. Absolutely not. It's an open competition in my, in my thoughts. It's an open competition with advantages for those who will be part 
and those who will not be part. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what, what's the fan reaction been? Because I guess if you're a Club Bruges fan, you're happy because this is very exciting. But if you support one of the smaller clubs, you're, you're worried about being left behind here and maybe not involved. Yeah, and, and you have perhaps also to think about the particularities in, in Belgium, the French part and the Dutch part of Belgium. We have to, 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 be, to be sure that the fans are okay with such a project, of course. What do they prefer? Are you sure that all the fans of the big clubs prefer to play against Dutch clubs? And what about European competitions? That's a big question, isn't it? Would you have as many Belgian clubs in the Champions League if this happened? I'm quite sure that it will be not possible to have 10 European tickets for uh, the Netherlands and for Belgium when at the same time there are six or seven tickets for the big leagues. It's, it's not possible. Then we lose European football and we have to discuss it. It could open the, the floodgates, couldn't it? Could you have Scotland and England joining together? Could you have other countries joining together? This could set a precedent, couldn't it, if, if, it, if it works for, for Belgium Maybe. and the Netherlands? We have all heard about Baltic competition, uh, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia and others uh, in the Balkans and so on. That's perhaps the, the good direction for a lot of leagues. And finally, Pierre... You've calmed things down a bit. You've told us there's a long way to go here. There's a long process. Give us a percentage, though. What are the chances of this happening, of having a Belgian and Netherlands league joining together, the Benner League? What are the chances in percentage terms? Sorry for my answer, but in football, you never know. Never. (laughs) (laughs) Over 50%? (laughs) You never know. You'll see. Uh, That is Pierre-Francois, the CEO of the Belgian Pro League. Pat Nevin and Heather O'Reilly are with me. And interestingly, both of the regions that you're from have been linked with this idea of of cross-border leagues in the past. Uh, Pat, at one stage, that there were even discussions, I remember, for an Atlantic League. So this would link the Netherlands and Belgium with Scotland, Portugal, Sweden and Denmark. And of course, we mentioned um, Celtic and Rangers at the top of the programme. There's always been talk about them potentially moving to the English Premier League. Would that be ever something you'd support, a join up between Scotland and England? I think the Scotland and England one is highly unlikely, although with the one caveat, there is an English team playing in the Scottish divisions as we speak (laughs) in Berwick Rangers. Um, But uh, I think with the, the English, they would say, why? What's the benefit to them? Because, you know, the English League's doing very well. Thank you very much at the moment. Um, If you look somewhere down the line, you were asking them there, you know, what's it going to look like? You've got to look 30, 40, 50 years ahead and things will look very different. These things have been in the pipeline for a long time. You mentioned the Atlantic League, other leagues joining up. One day it will happen and certainly COVID's had an effect on some of the clubs and I thought that it may well be that uh, the clubs, if they cannot financially survive, and remember the very big club, biggest clubs in Europe are getting bigger and they want to get bigger still and they want to have all of the television monies or the vast majority of them. And by the way, that's what it's all about, mm. as we all know. And you can see anything else, but that's what it's all about. And I understand the argument uh, that the small leagues, the, you know, in Netherlands and Belgium, saying to themselves, well, wait a minute, we can't get near the Italian league or the English league or the Spanish league. We need to do something. I don't like the idea, but I understand the concept of it because if they don't try and make themselves bigger and make themselves competitive, they may well die away anyway. Heather, there's been this speculation in, in the USA, hasn't there, about maybe one day the MLS merging with the top league in Mexico. Could you, could you ever see that happening over there? I could see a form of it happening. And I think, like Pat said, I mean, it has to be a sort of win-win for both sides, right? It needs to be a one plus one equals three situation. And there has to be benefit uh, of both parties. And I think for, for the U.S., um, interestingly, the Mexican League, uh, Liga M- MX, is the most watched football beyond MLS. More people watch it than the MLS, and more people watch it than watch the Premier League wow. in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because there's 40 million people living in the U.S. of uh, Mexican descent, Mexican heritage. So 
the passion is strong. The following is really strong. The commercial synergies and opportunities are really strong. Um, there's, you know, a lot of logistics that I think would need to be worked out, but I think that uh, collaborative efforts will uh, be in the future there, certainly. And and you have to remember that the 2026 World Cup is actually going to be hosted across Canada, U.S., and Mexico. So there's a really strong uh, opportunity there if they approach this the right way. Um, and Pat, what, what you said as well really struck a chord, actually, because I, I got the impression from talking to Pierre that, as you say, this is all a reaction from the so-called smaller nations to all this talk about European Super League, expanded Champions League, they have to hit back in some way, don't they? Or they're just going to become irrelevant and, and forgotten about. Yes, and my understanding is, you know, if you're in any business and your competitors, inverted commas, are growing and growing massively, well, if you stand still, you won't stand still, you'll fall away. And so I, I fully understand that it... In a perfect world, I wouldn't want that to happen. I mean, I would, you know, the, the nations have actually did very well over, you know, over a century, you know, to keep their leagues independent and kept them strong and they've, they've, they've waxed and waned over the years. But in reality, as time goes on, you know, things will adapt and things will change. And it is about the other bigger teams. And he said a very, you asked some very good questions there. And one of the things he said in there, it, it was just a throwaway line, but I thought, yes, I want to hear that. He said it will be open competition. Mm. Now, that's mm. what we want to hear because we've been hearing other people suggesting lesser than open competitions. You know, the big clubs can stay in these big competitions, whatever happens. Well, that's not the spirit of football or certainly football the way it has been in the, in Europe for, from time in, in memoriam since the game actually started. So open competition, if the games grow, it might be something that could happen and it might have benefits. The one group it won't have benefits for, I'm, I'm pretty sure, the, the much smaller clubs, it will be much harder on them. The pie will be divided, the financial pie will be divided, and they will get less of it. Let's move on now, because I want to discuss a really moving moment from Italian football this week. The former national team coach, Cesare Prandelli, has, has quit his job at Fiorentina after admitting a dark cloud has developed inside him. In an open letter which was published on the club's website, Prandelli says he's going through profound distress and he's stepping away from football. And here are some more of the, the really emotional quotes from this letter. I think it's, it's really, it was remarkable when I read this. It, it was very, very touching. In life, he says, as well as the good times, there are also dark moments which can get on top of you. I've been through a period of profound distress which is preventing me from being who I really am. Heather, that's remarkable, isn't it? Because normally when a coach resigns, you, you do get a statement, but it's always quite dry, thanking the players, thanking the club. But this was so, so different and incredibly honest. It was. And um, I think that we're in a time right now where mental health is being discussed a little bit more openly and candidly. And it, it takes some really brave characters to to be in the spotlight and, and talk about that. And and for Prendelli, I mean, you know, it's quite obvious that he's in a very tough and dark space. He didn't need to be as candid as he was with the club, with the fans. Um, he could just step away quietly. But uh, I think his his honesty will actually help other people. And, you know, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I would like to think and believe that he will get out of this. He will get out of this dark cloud and... And when he does, I hope that he continues to be a manager somewhere. I think he's a fantastic coach, a fantastic manager. And I hope that he finds his love uh, of football and his love of, of managing the game again. What did you make of it, Pat? Like Heather, um, the fact that he's had stresses and a possible depression, mental health problems, it's something that uh, in the game, certainly working with the PFA a number of years ago, we saw something that was growing, or whether it was growing or whether people, as Heather again says, are just more able to talk about and open up about and uh, get rid of the stigma about. It's been good to see that, but it's people often say, oh, you've, you've got that much money, you've been that successful, what have you got to worry about? It's a fundamental misunderstanding of those sorts of, sorts of health problems. He's gone through difficulties in his life anyway. He lost his wife. Um, he just had COVID, actually, in, in December there. But the stresses you get as a manager are absolutely incredible and cannot help that you know that tough time he's gone through. Sometimes it's a very brave de decision to step down. It's the braver one, you know, to, 
carrying on when you know you aren't capable of it and doing yourself even more damage and being able to stand up and doing that. I think that's helped a lot of people that he's managed to do that because, you know, he has been so fantastically successful through the entirety of his career. And don't forget, what a playing career he had as well. <laughs> yeah. um, so all those things put together, and I think everywhere I was going to say in Italy, but everyone around the world of football will certainly be you know, hoping for the best for them. Finally, this week, we're going to arguably the most exciting league in Europe at the moment. Where is it, I hear you ask? Is it Serie A? Is it Liga? Is it the Bundesliga? No, I'm talking about the Romanian second division. This caught our eye because, stick with me, it is pretty remarkable. Going into the final round of matches, only four points separate the top 11 teams. 11 teams separated by four points at the top. It couldn't be much tighter and anything could happen going into the final day. The format of this second division is a bit unusual. Teams play each other only once and the top six qualify for the the promotion playoffs, which are coming up. And Meta Loglobus Bucharest go into the final match of the regular season, knowing that a win will book their place in the playoffs. And they're playing one of the giants of Romanian football, Rapid Bucharest, who are level on points, but they have an inferior goal difference. So there are mixed emotions for the biggest star of the second division, the former Romania international Ovidio Herrera. He's had a very successful career. He had a successful spell for Rapid, and now he can stop them reaching the playoffs. And he says it's great to play in such an exciting league right now. Yes, it's uh, very exciting. It's a tight battle where the top 11 teams have a real chance to make the playoffs. And uh, this is great uh, for us, being a small team, compared to our other competitors. And you're playing against Rapid Bucharest, your old team, the team you supported as a boy. Tell me what it's going to be like playing in this game where you can effectively deny them promotion. Yes, I played from Rapid uh, for seven years. Rapid uh, will always hold a special uh, place in my heart. And uh, yes, I'm a big fan. But uh, that doesn't stop me from uh, doing my job at the club I'm currently playing for. Of course, I will feel sorry for them (laughs) if they do not make the playoffs. But uh, only one of us will be able to catch the first six. Do you have friends and family who are Rapid fans? Are your friends and family going to be watching on TV cheering on Rapid or, or cheering on you? Yes, I have a lot of friends there. I keep in touch with them. I know everything that uh, is going on uh, at Rapid at the moment. And it's not a pleasant situation that I play against them. <laughs> on the pitch, when the game starts, do you forget you, are, you used to be a Rapid player? Do you forget you're a Rapid fan? and you're just concentrated on the game? Or will you be thinking about it during the match? Oh, this is a difficult question. (laughs) And uh, I don't know. I uh, hope I will win this uh, game. I want to give my best in this game, and I hope my team will go in the first uh, six places. Why do you think it's so close this season? To have that many teams in with a chance of promotion, why, why do you think it's so close and, and so exciting? There are a lot of teams with a reputation in the second division that uh, wanted to get into the playoffs. And this has made this season very competitive. Have you ever seen it like this before? As close as this before in Romanian football, whether it's the, the top league or the second league? No, never. I think it's the first uh, year when 11 teams have real chance to go in the first league. And is it all that everyone's talking about? Is the second league more exciting than the first league this season? Are more people yes. talking about the second league than the top yes. league? Because we have uh, in this league Rapid, Ucluj, Timisara. Uh, big teams uh, with uh, a lot of fans and uh, this is uh, more exciting. Let's take you forward to the weekend. How do you think it's going to go? What do you think is going to happen? Will you have to keep in touch with the other results during the game to find out what other teams are doing? If we win, we go sure in the in the playoffs and this is more important for us now. 
to win this game. But I'm very confident because we have shown this season that we have a very good team and this can be seen in the results that we have. One last question. What if there's a penalty in the game against Rapid? Would you take it against your old team, against the team you supported? Would you, would you like to take the penalty if there's a penalty, say, in the last minute? Uh, I will take the ball and uh, I hope I will score. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is the former Romania international, Ovidiu Herrera. Good luck to him this weekend. So there are two things that I want to pick up on, Pat and, and Heather. It's um, playing against the club y- you support, which we'll talk about in a moment. But first, final day drama. When it all comes down to the final day and it's really close. Have you got any stories, Heather? Let's start with you. Anything come down to the final day in your career? I did have a, a time in 2009. I was playing for a team called Sky Blue FC, and we were just, uh, you know, in American leagues, you know, playing for um, playoffs. But we needed a few things to happen. We needed to take care of business on our side, and we needed some results to fall our way from some opponents. And I remember we did our job, but we were still waiting to hear about a result from from another game. And I couldn't take it. I was so stressed. I couldn't take it. And my friends were going to play golf. Pat, you would love this. And I barely play. I barely play golf. And so I did that. I was on the golf course, but I told my friend to, you know, keep me posted if it was something that I would want to know. <laughs> and um, you know, the uh, the unexpected happened, and the result that we needed happened. And my friend told me that you know this team had won and. Or, or scored, rather, and there was like five minutes left. And I yelled so loud. I think everybody on the, on the course definitely thought that uh, there had been a hole-in-one that was scored because I was just, like, ecstatic. But, yeah, it's, it is so thrilling when it comes down to the last day. I was luckily on the good side of it that time, but, man, is it painful if it doesn't go your way. There's something about golf courses on the final day. I remember Sir Alex Ferguson, when Manchester United won the Premier League for the first time, he was on the golf course. Someone came out to tell him. Uh, Pat, what about you? Any final day drama? Well, it's, it's quite a thing in Scotland, and it has been for a number of years, that in the final day of the season, quite often as a, if there's a battle between two teams, they send up a helicopter. Call it Helicopter Sunday. Oh, yeah. Because Scotland's not such a big country, so the helicopter hangs around waiting to decide where to take the trophy. <laughs> it's a great idea, and you've got the cameras <laughs> following the helicopter. It is an amazing thing. That is a really good idea. And that's happened a few times, uh, certainly in the time that uh, I was up and playing in Scotland and watching Scotland. But the giveaway line is playoffs, and playoffs have changed everything. This used to be a rare thing. But since the invention of playoffs, it happens really quite regularly. And certainly many times in my career involved in playoffs, you wouldn't know five minutes before the end of the game which league you were playing in, which is an extraordinary thing you know, for the next season. So everything is up in the air and the stress and the tension. And you, you, the last thing in the world you want to hear is people shouting on, right, you know, you only need a draw. Well, you might need a draw just now, but in three minutes' time, you might need a win. <laughs> Don't complicate it. But there has been one team that in the past that were told to go for a draw, went for a draw and they ended up it was a mistake. So in the end, go for it and make sure you get the win. And uh, that, that should do it. But having said that, I wouldn't want to be in the Romanian second division just kind of, <laughs> because you would need a supercomputer to try and work out what's going mm. on there. There's so many permutations. Yeah, my brain hurts looking at that table. Yeah. <laughs> 11 <laughs> teams, four points. I've never seen that before. So, so on to uh, playing against the team you support. I, I can relate to this in a way because... I've had to report on the team I I support and I had to do it recently actually and had to commentate on a penalty against the team I support and it is strange, kind of professionalism does kick in in a way and you kind of forget you're a fan for five minutes but what's it like when you play against the team you support, the team you grew up supporting? Well, well, I've only did it once or twice and it's kind of hard, it's kind of weird. I've played something like 850 professional games in my career and I was nervous once and it was a friendly it was only a friendly midway through my career for Everton against Celtic and because <laughs> Celtic was my team as a kid and I didn't know what this feeling was Was I had to go and say to the manager I'm not feeling very well there's something wrong with my stomach <laughs> and he mm. looked at me and he started laughing and he goes you're nervous and he'd never seen me and I didn't know what it was because I'd never felt it before that is an extraordinary thing you know not only the team you he supported but the maybe a team you played for I mean that's even I would argue that's even more painful. That That's caused me more pain over the years. 
it's pretty crazy, Pat, but I have the same exact story as you did as playing against a team that I uh, sort of left or asked to leave. It just wasn't a great setup. Um, it was a team up in Boston, and the, the manager was still there. Most of the squad was still there when we had played them the, the next year. And same with you. I felt totally sick to my stomach. I actually had to run over to this <laughs> to the sideline and essentially ask to get subbed out in the second half because I just was, like, not feeling good. It was just some kind of eerie feeling. Um, we, we were winning at that point, so I felt okay about it. But, um, yeah, the, the passions and the emotions do come in. And even if you try to stifle them with your professionalism, uh, we're only human. Let's see how a video gets on in the uh, Romanian second division this week. Thanks very much, Pat. Thanks very much. Heather, time is up for world football this week. We'll all be back uh, next week. Make sure you join us all then. Goodbye. 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 World Football is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service.